Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the Different Strokes Virtual Conference 2020. Uh, you'll be aware this is a conference that's running all week, uh, but today and tomorrow has a distinctly Scottish feel. Uh, so we welcome everyone today to this session. You'll be aware there'll be a further session this afternoon where we'll be an opportunity to reflect on what you've heard this morning and perhaps explore it in a bit more detail. Uh, my name is Alan Cowie. I'm the Director of Services at Chest Heart Stroke Scotland, and I'll be doing my best to chair this morning's session. Uh, today, uh, we are going to hear from Professor Martin Dennis, uh, who's going to give you a professional and personal overview of stroke care in Scotland. Uh, I know a lot of you will know Martin either by reputation or perhaps through your own treatment, uh, but perhaps not be aware of uh, Martin's uh, biography. Uh, he was appointed uh, to the first consultant uh, role in stroke uh, back in 1990 at the Western General in Edinburgh, uh, where he subsequently created uh, a stroke service in the hospital. He was appointed to his chair in 2002 uh, and has established uh, the British Association of Stroke Physicians, uh, which oversees training and continued personal development for stroke doctors across the country. He set up uh, the Scottish Stroke Care Audit, uh, in 2005, uh, which seeks to better understand the quality of care in stroke services and improve them as a consequence. And he has been, uh, since its inception in 2003, uh, the chair of the Scottish Government's National Advisory Committee for Stroke, uh, which plays a leading part uh, in the ongoing improvement of stroke services uh, uh, across Scotland. Uh, during the course uh, of this morning, uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. I know a number of you have already set questions in, and Martin's aware of those, and he'll, he'll answer them as he goes through. Uh, but if you have questions arising, either from what you hear this morning, or maybe some questions you brought with you, uh, please use the Q&A. Apologies, we seem to have a slight technical hitch there. Uh, what I was saying is if you have questions you wish to ask uh, as a consequence of what you hear this morning, please use the Q&A function or the chat function. Uh, and I'll do my best to make sure I'm monitoring that. Uh, so when Martin uh, comes to the end of his presentation, uh, we'll feed some of your questions through. We're likely to run for about an hour or so, uh, but if we finish early, uh, we'll, we'll close as, as we see appropriate. Uh, so without any other forward delays from me, I'll hand over to Professor Dennis Martin. Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, I'll go on, I'll just share some slides with the audience. So excuse me for getting those up. Um, Alan, can you just confirm that they are there? I can see it coming. <laughs> yes, it's there, Martin. Thanks so much, and please let me know if they're not moving on. So, um, welcome everybody, um, and I look forward to just telling you a little bit about what's going on in Scotland at the moment with respect to programme for government. So, pro for those who aren't familiar with this term, it's really equivalent, I suppose, to the Queen's speech in, uh, in England. So, this is the programme that the government sets for itself every year and it's renewed. So I'm talking really about the program for government uh, which was started about a year ago and we're now a year into it. And it, for the first time in Scotland, it included specific commitments with respect to stroke. Those commitments are as follows. Firstly, uh, to appoint a specialty advisor to the chief medical officer on stroke care. Uh, this hadn't been a, a post uh, beforehand. Um, it has now been appointed and I'll come back to that. And the role of this is to advise the Chief Medical Officer about all things relating to stroke, but also to take a lead in taking the commitments for Programme for Government forward. The second one was to ensure that there was a national planning framework in place for high quality 
and clinically safe thrombectomy service. More of that later. Thirdly, to collaborate across the Scottish Government on stroke prevention and raising awareness of the signs of stroke. Fourthly, to review and improve the current stroke care bundle to improve outcomes for patients. The stroke care bundle includes a number of objective measures which we monitor in all of the acutely admitting stroke hospitals and it looks at the uh, proportion of patients getting into a stroke unit uh, within the first day of admission, the proportion having a swallow screen within four hours, the proportion getting a CT scan within 12 hours of admission, and the proportion getting aspirin within the first couple of days of admission. And then the bundle looks at how many patients achieve that, that all of those where they're appropriate. Also, the final and probably the most important commitment was to begin work to scope out and define what a progressive stroke service in Scotland would look like so that future programmes for government can look at implementing that. So I'll go through each of these commitments in turn to see to tell you how we're getting on with those. First of all, uh, appointing a specialty advisor. Um, that appointment uh, process started uh, in August 2019, but wasn't completed until uh, March 2020, when I was appointed uh, to, to that post uh, uh, on a two day a week basis. The rest of my time I work with the University and NHS Lothian. Uh, they gave a, quite a lot of priority to this, so they also appointed Dr. Fiona Wright, who is a consultant stroke physician and geriatrician working in NHS Glasgow, and she was appointed as a deputy advisor uh, one day a week. I think that was uh, a very good idea. Uh, as you might tell from uh, m my appearance, I'm getting on in years. Um, I'm 64 years old now, and will, sorry, 63 years old now, I'm getting forgetful, and will be retiring in the next couple of years. So it's very important, I think, uh, for there to be succession planning in the leadership of stroke services across Scotland. And Dr Fiona Wright and other younger colleagues are taking up roles within the setup in Scotland uh, so that it should be a fairly seamless handover over the next year or two. The next commitment was to ensure that there was a national planning framework in place for the high quality and clinically safe thrombectomy service. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about thrombectomy because this is probably the most exciting aspect of stroke care which has occurred certainly in my career. There was actually, uh, uh, we started doing work on thrombectomy in Scotland back in 2015 when the randomized trials demonstrating it was a very effective treatment were published. That was in January 2015. We discussed it at the National Advisory Committee in uh, the following month, where we all agreed that this was a priority. But as uh, uh, our discussions to this morning will probably demonstrate to you, this has been very complicated to implement and it remains a major challenge. So thrombectomy is a treatment for ischemic stroke. Those are the strokes due to blockages of blood vessels rather than burst blood vessels. And they make up about 85% of all strokes admitted to Scottish hospitals. About 8,000 patients were admitted to Scottish hospitals each year with a stroke. 7,000 of those will be ischemic strokes due to a blocked artery. And they vary hugely in their severity, but it is a, an important cause of death with about 1,000 of those patients dying within the first few months. About 3,000 will make a very good recovery but another 3,000 will probably remain dependent on others for some aspects of 
to everyday living, such as washing or dressing or mobility. And some may have to live in a nursing home or care home uh, for the rest of their life. So stroke has a, as you will probably be very aware of, has some catastrophic uh, effects on some individuals. So what happens when an artery blocks? This is an arteriogram. So this is where dye has been injected into the uh, a vein in the arm and it shows up the arteries in the body. And this is the internal carotid artery and you have one on each side of your neck and it feeds blood up into the brain. And this is what a, an artery should look like when it is uh, branching like a tree and feeding blood into all parts of the brain. This is the anterior cell artery. However, this arteriogram shows a blockage of an artery called the middle cell artery at, at the point of the arrow. It should be showing a similar network to this. And this is this would be causing major symptoms of a stroke. Maybe weakness down one side. If it's on the left side of the brain, it would be affecting the speech. It might be affecting the vision to the right side. When that sort of thing happens, and here's a diagram of the brain, you can see this is the internal carotid artery coming up and it goes into the middle cell artery. And if there's a blockage in this artery, one gets a, an area of brain which isn't working and very rapidly becomes irreversibly damaged. But surrounding that ischemic core, as it's known, there's an area of brain where the nerves are not working, but the damage done is reversible. And if the artery can be opened up, this may start working again and won't evolve as this diagram shows into a larger and larger area of permanently damaged brain, which would lead the person to have severe deficits and may lead them to be dependent on others for the rest of their lives. So what we're trying to do in thrombectomy and other hypercute treatments is to minimize the amount of black area and reverse the reversible in this browner area. So we would like the arteriogram to look, which might have looked like this initially, to look like this when we've opened up the blood vessel and the brain that this supplies can recover and the symptoms can resolve and it reduces the amount of brain damage. There are a couple of methods we use to unblock arteries. The one we've been using since the mid 1990s and increasingly over the last 10 years are the clot busting drugs or so-called thrombolytic drugs. The most widely known of these is a drug called alteplase. This drug injected into the vein detects th clot or thrombus attaches itself to that and then increases the rate at which it is dissolved. And this has been shown in, in very large randomized trials to effectively improve the outcome of stroke patients, those with ischemic strokes, if it's given within the first four and a half hours of symptom onset. It dissolves the clot, it makes the artery open up quicker and reduces the amount of damage done. The second way of unblocking arteries is the thrombectomy, sometimes referred to as mechanical thrombectomy or clot retrieval, where a tube, this is a catheter, a very fine catheter, is inserted into the blocked artery. The catheter can be pushed through the blocked artery and then expanded to open up this little network. This is called a stent retriever. And then one pulls it back through the clot and the clot comes with it. And that's a way of rapidly removing the clot, 
opening up the artery without the need for giving a drug which can increase the risk of bleeding. Now, this is just a diagram, similar to the diagrams we use to discuss treatments with patients, which shows the effect of clot busting drugs, that, such as alteplase, if it's given within three hours of an ischemic stroke. And the earlier we give this treatment, or indeed the earlier we do a thrombectomy, the more the brain is likely to recover and the better the outcomes. So if we treat 100 patients with alteplase within three hours, of those 100, 10 will avoid being dependent on others when they would otherwise have been so. So it isn't a cure for everybody. Indeed, some of these patients will be, make a good recovery on their own. But one in 10 will benefit from having alteplase. If we were to give this between three and four and a half hours after the onset, only five out of the hundred would benefit. Going back to thrombectomy, this can unblock large arteries. It isn't designed for unblocking the smaller arteries which can be handled by the alteplase or clot busting. It can be used in patients who've already had the clot busting drug. So we can do that quite quickly, often within 20 minutes or 30 minutes of arrival at hospital. It takes a little longer to set up a thrombectomy. So the clot busting drug can be working while we're carrying on to thrombectomy. But it also importantly can be given in those patients who cannot have clot busting drugs, such as those on anticoagulation, perhaps for atrial fibrillation, or those who have had a recent operation or accident, where giving a clot busting drug can cause serious bleeding. This CT scan is actually a CT angiogram. So again, dye has been injected into the patient's arm just at the before the scan is done. And the dye shows the arteries up as white in this case. This is a normal middle cerebral artery on the right, patient's right hand side. And this is the blocked middle cerebral artery on the patient's left hand side. The other arteries are open. So this patient is likely to have a right sided weakness with loss of speech and possible loss of uh, vision to the right. If the patient is seen and admitted within six hours of onset, or indeed, even if the patient wakes up with the symptoms and we're, therefore we're not sure when they came on, but are within 16 hours of onset, we can with appropriate CT scanning and MR scanning, determine whether there's still salvageable brain tissue, which can be helped by a thrombectomy. To do a thrombectomy, we need a team, an interventional radiologist or interventional neuroradiologist with an anaesthetist, a nurse, a radiographer, working in a special catheter lab with a biplanar imaging suite, and there are very few of these around, with the appropriate catheters, etc., and a trained team, and we'll need these 24-7 uh, to treat everybody. We need this and we need the catheters. And this is the stent retrieval I've already shown you. And just to give you an idea of the costs of this sort of thing, each one of these, and one might use one or two during a procedure, costs 8,000 pounds. Now, this is well worthwhile because the thrombectomy is very effective. So if one treats 100 patients with thrombectomy, within six hours of onset, 40 people, that's all of these ones in orange and all the ones in pink, will have less disability than they would otherwise have had. And the 20 will avoid dependency on others. So it's twice as effective as the clot busting drugs, but in addition, um, 
the benefits are in addition to that. So by treating with clot busting and thrombectomy, 30 people in 100 can avoid dependency and benefit another 20 with having a less disability than they would otherwise have had. So about one in two patients having the combination of treatment will benefit. It is like thrombolysis or clot busting, less effective if the treatment is delayed. So for every hour that the treatment is delayed, one gets seven fewer good outcomes per 100 patients treated. Only a small proportion of people beyond six hours will actually benefit from thrombectomy. And we have to try and select those patients on the basis of what's called advanced brain imaging. So the, as I said, the trials showing that thrombectomy was an effective treatment were published in 2015. This came as a bit of a surprise because in 2013, two big American trials which had shown the results from a previous type of thrombectomy had shown that it was ineffective. But the trials, the seven trials using more modern technologies demonstrated these dramatic improvements. In, this, in Scotland, we rapidly put the evidence to the Scottish Health Technology Assessment Group. And on the basis of that, they recommended that this should be implemented by NHS Scotland. We, we, reckon, we changed the guidelines, both the London-based RCP guidelines and SIGN guidelines, and they both recommend that we should implement thrombectomy. And NHS England rapidly established a national implementation plan uh, for the guidance of commissioners. It took a little time to get the traction that we wanted in Scotland, but in 2017, we started meeting to try and plan the, the, um, the process. And since 2018, the Scottish government has had a national planning process in, in uh, going forward, which I've been part of. So at the moment, we have a thrombectomy advisory group. It's meeting very frequently. We have another meeting this Friday uh, and we're meeting at least monthly. This is overseeing work being done in all 14 NHS boards who are trying to prepare themselves for the implementation of thrombectomy. We're expecting to start at least a very limited service in nine wells within the next month or so. And this service will eventually serve the north of Scotland. That is certainly going to be um, Tayside, Grampian and the Islands and Highland. We're still planning the services in Edinburgh and Glasgow and don't have a definite date for this starting. However, there are many challenges to overcome and I'm sure this will come back to this in the question and answer session. There's a major lack of operators across the UK and indeed across the world, and it takes two or three years to train somebody to be competent in this. We have a lack of biplanar angio suites. These cost one or two million pounds and therefore they fall into major capital planning and investment for the NHS and that takes time. There's a lack of the support teams. We have too few stroke physicians, too few radiographers, nurses and ambulance staff who are trained in delivery of thrombectomy. This all takes time. And of course in Scotland we've got a quite a challenging geography with quite a, a, a distributed and remote population in many parts. I'll come back to that in questions. The third uh, part of the Scottish Government's commitments are uh, to raise awareness of the signs of stroke. And we've been having meetings with the Stroke Association and CHSS to, to see how we can build on previous stroke awareness raising and the FAST campaign. We're using opportunities such as the launch of a STARS Refresh, which is the online training for all staff in Scotland, 
thrombectomy, Scottish stroke care audit reports to raise awareness amongst public and healthcare staff. And we're trying to work with the Scottish Government for them to link across their uh, departments, such as with education and sport, to try and improve stroke prevention. Over the last six months, we've been reviewing the stroke services in an all NHS boards. We've had detailed meetings with each MCN, Managed Clinical Network, in each of the NHS boards and are producing reports on each. We're trying to identify examples of good practice where this can be shared and areas where there needs to be improvement. We recently published the Scottish Stroke Improvement Programme National Report, which we do each year. This had to be done all online this year because of COVID. And obviously COVID has impacted quite significantly on not only our delivery of stroke care, but also on our monitoring of it. Lastly, we are working on scoping out and defining what a progressive stroke service will look like. This is going to be based on our review of the current services, as in Commitment 4. Last year, the Scottish Government and the uh, Health Improvement Scotland and Scottish uh, Planning Board supported us in doing some horizon scanning for stroke, where we were trying to identify those th developments which are coming up, we think, based on evidence, which we will need to implement in the next few years. We wish we'd had that uh, in 2015 or 2014, because we may have been ahead of the game in terms of thrombectomy. And Health Improvement Scotland, so-called HIS, have committed to reviewing the evidence for every part of the stroke journey, which is shown on the right. Our MCN subgroup and rehabilitation subgroups of the National Advisory Committee will produce a blueprint of what a progressive stroke service looks like, looking at the whole patient journey from the pre-hospital, which is when the, patient, when the patient hasn't even arrived at a hospital and is being managed by primary care or the Scottish Ambulance Service, those patients who don't need hospitalisation, who just need outpatient care, which in many cases is now done remotely in the patient's home. The hyperacute treatment, which I've said something about today. Stroke unit care, which is all about preventing complications and pro providing early rehabilitation. And then here, early inpatient rehabilitation community rehabilitation and the important interface between the two, so there's continuity, and then the ongoing self-management and support for patients who have not recovered well from stroke, either physically or psychologically. So we're trying to address what the best possible care is in each of these areas. So some possible components of a progressive stroke service might look like having ambulance crews who are better trained in stroke recognition, but can also access help from a stroke specialist via video call while still in the patient's home. To better support their decision-making about where to take the patient, whether it's to their local thrombolysis center or to a thrombectomy center, and again, support that by specialists and by IT. For patients to be able to access specialist stroke care wherever they are, whenever they need it, using the sort of technology we're now getting more familiar with. And rapid treatment with both drop clot busting and thrombectomy, whenever that's appropriate. We need to improve the quality of stroke unit care by better training of our staff, better facilities, and I think most importantly, by supporting those staff and the patients and their relatives using IT. We've got plenty of ideas for doing that. We need to ensure that the stroke care meets the aims and wishes of the patients and their expectations. So we need to be much better at identifying what each patient and which family prioritise 
and trying to meet their personal expectations and get goals. We need to be tailoring the information we give to patients and their families to the individual. At the moment, you're probably experienced in receiving verbal information without audiovisual support, but also leaflets, which aren't tailored to you as an individual and have quite a lot of irrelevant information in to make them relevant to others. So we're trying to make that available digitally as well as on paper. We need to make rehabilitation and care during, uh, after, through discharge and into the community as seamless as possible. Really joined up care is vital. We need the best possible treatments to reduce the risk of recurrence. And many patients will be on aspirin or clopidogrel. They'll be on statins, blood pressure reduction. They may have had a carotid operation on their neck. But there are other treatments coming along which can reduce the risk of recurrence. And importantly, patients should receive the ongoing support they need and want. A couple of words about my views about needs and wants. I definitely think we should be prioritizing those things which we reliably know when I say reliably, it's usually based on large randomized controlled trials. So we should be prioritizing those things which reduce the risk of stroke, which reduce the effects of stroke on, on people who've had one, and improves the lives of people with stroke. And provide that care in a caring, and compassionate way. I think we have to distinguish those aspects of care from the wants, which may be that something sounds as if it should work, such as certain uh, stroke rehabilitation for this or that aspect, where there is no good evidence that it actually does what it says on the tin. If we prioritize those needs, those wants rather than needs, we risk wasting valuable resources on things like tests or treatments or services, which have names which sound like they would be good for you, but may not be, and indeed may actually be harmful. It was very interesting that one of the first randomized trials I set up in back in the 1990s tested a stroke family care worker in a randomized trial, and that sounded like an excellent intervention which would help people. Actually, we demonstrated that we couldn't identify any benefit and there was potential harm because the stroke family care worker worked by supporting people, yes, but also possibly by taking away the responsibility for patients' own care and to, didn't encourage them to be empowered to improve their outcome. So we have to be very careful about treatments and services which sound like they're a good idea, but may not achieve the aims we want. So our targets in the short term are to roll thrombectomy out as quickly, safely and as sustainably as practical. By March 2021, we have uh, agreed that we would produce a report for the Scottish Government on the current state of stroke services and a description of the progressive stroke service going forward. And by the end of next year, produce an implementation plan for the Scottish Government about how we will get from where we are now to where we would like to get to in the future. I'll finish there. Uh, I can, uh, these are the questions that I received in advance and I'll answer these uh, briefly and then be happy to take any questions from others. I think I've told you about the latest information with regard to thrombectomy services in Scotland. In, in the UK, they are a little further forward. They are delivering thrombectomy in 25 neuroscience centres, mostly only within uh, limited hours. So they, they have 24 seven services in six centres now. And the only centre which has really been going for very long on the 24 seven basis 
is St George's in London. They were hoping to treat around about a thousand patients this year, although I think COVID has got in the way of that ambition. They are limited by all the things that limit us in Scotland, the lack of interventionists to do the procedures, the lack of the, the angio suites and the lack of trained staff. I'm sure we'll come back to that in further questioning. I've been asked a very uh, specific question about a very rare congenital heart problem. So those babies born with a single ventricle instead of two ventricles. This occurs in about one in 20,000 births. And patients with major congenital heart disease are at risk of having ischemic strokes and in some cases will benefit from having an anticoagulant to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. But the decision to use an anticoagulant is always a complex one, is individualized based on an individual assessment of the patient's benefits and the risks of anticoagulation, especially when you're talking about maybe treating treat children. The last question I found pretty complicated and, and very broad, of course. So it says stroke impacts society globally. It does indeed. And every country struggles to differing degrees with managing stroke. So I'm being asked, have we in Scotland applied appropriately what society as a whole has learnt and how do we get assurances this is the case? I think we've been very, we've been at the forefront indeed of looking at what we know works in, in stroke care. Scotland is the home of the Cochrane Stroke Research Group, which reviews all of the randomised trials done in, in stroke across the world. And this is fed into guidelines. So they're very aware of what works and what doesn't work. We've also tried to make our services um, cover the whole patient journey, at least to some extent. So in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, there were pretty good services from stroke prevention, hyperacute care, stroke unit care, and then rehabilitation. Not as good as everywhere. And there's plenty of work to be done to improve that. There are places in the world where we look to and are very envious of the resources at their disposal. The numbers of doctors and nurses, the numbers of beds available, the number of therapists available. And that is uh, something which we are always trying to improve on, but we are limited by budgets which are set down by governments. And it's all about prioritization. We do spend a lot of money on stroke in Scotland, probably not as much as we should, but we probably waste quite a lot of money as well across the NHS, doing things which probably have little benefit for patients. And we're not that good at prioritising them. In other parts of the world, they might spend a lot more, but again, might spend it in areas which aren't beneficial. Those, those countries without national health services often have services which are all about making money for the doctors or the therapists. And they might be recommending things simply to increase their income. So what is happening elsewhere isn't always the ideal, but we do try and look across the world for the best ideas and try we will be trying to implement those in our will work going forward. So I'll finish then and happy to take any questions. Thank you Martin, uh, very informative. Uh, I really enjoyed that, I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, I have a number of questions uh, from our, uh, our colleagues today. Uh, I'll just take them uh, in the order they came. I think you may have answered this one already, Martin. Eric asks, what evidence are you taking from elsewhere 
uh, about what progressive stroke uh, service looks like, but I think you may have covered that in your last answer, unless there was anything else that you wanted to add. Um, certainly we're trying to, both through the Cochrane Group, uh, which is uh, coordinated by my colleagues Peter Langhorn and uh, Gillian Mead, both working in the central belt of Scotland. Uh, we should be aware of all the best evidence and what really does work. We are also very well connected in uh, Scotland with other parts of the world. You know, the tr for instance, the trials we've recently completed, uh, coordinated from Edinburgh, uh, looking at the, the value of using fluoxetine, an antidepressant, to see whether it improves recovery after stroke. We worked with colleagues in Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam, and we're having conversations every day with international colleagues and listening to what's happening in their countries and trying to take good ideas from them, picking from the best. But that isn't always based on good evidence, so we have to be careful. Thank you. Uh, Stuart uh, asks, as a beneficiary of both fast and thrombolysis, why do we not measure onset to scan time, which seems to be a really important measure? Uh, yes, we do measure that. Um, it isn't one of the uh, key measures that we publish, but every uh, stroke service in Scotland measures that and uh, reports on it locally. So um, we've chosen to look at the onset to treatment time, the whole journey. And indeed, we look at the uh, onset to arrival time as a measure of how the ambulance service is doing. We, we're interested in and looking at whether the ambulance service has pre-alerted us, because that can help reduce the door to needle time. We look at the door to scan time and then the scan to treatment time. So we measure all of those things and work on trying to reduce those which seem too long. They are too long in Scotland. We would like to do as well as our colleagues say in Helsinki do, where their average uh, door to, their average door to needle time is probably 20 to 30 minutes. But if one goes to Helsinki, one can perhaps see why, because they have many more people to help push that process through available 24 seven. In most Scottish hospitals, we don't have resident stroke experts. Um, most of that, the hyperacute treatment is overseen by the emergency medicine team who are supported by a stroke specialist working remotely. As part of the thrombectomy planning, there will be a specialist stroke nurse in all of the acutely admitting stroke hospitals, which will, I hope, help reduce our door to needle time. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think you've already answered this, but Eric asks, why has Scotland taken so long to get started with planning a thrombectomy service? Is there anything else you want to add? We've been planning for quite a time. We have major challenges. We have at the moment four and maybe now five interventional neuroradiologists. Four of those are working in Edinburgh. One has just arrived in Nine Wells. Prior to that, there was work for six interventional neuroradiologists to treat patients who had had strokes due to bleeding those with subarachnoid hemorrhage who needed their aneurysms coiling, those with arterial venous malformations who needed their arterial venous malformations treating. We could, or the others could have, it wasn't in my decision, they could have said, well, we're gonna prioritize thrombectomy, but that would have led to this large group of patients each year not receiving the treatments to prevent them having another bleed, which could have been catastrophic. So dis difficult decisions are being made. I hope that within the next few months, we will get to a stage when we will be tr starting to treat patients with thrombectomy. Certainly in, in north of Scotland, it's hopefully in the east, and I hope not too long before we're also treating patients in the west. But we won't be offering a 24 seven service until we've probably got about eight interventional neuroradiologists to support a 24 seven service and interventional radiologists treat, uh, trained up in the north. So we'll need about 16 operators in total if we're gonna deliver this. 
We also need at least three new angio suites, which are going through their planning processes at the moment. Thank you. Uh, a couple of people, uh, Heather uh, and Angela in particular, have been asking how are we involving people uh, in the, the, the improvement of stroke services uh, moving forward? Yeah, um, I think we involve them in many different ways. Of course, most of my colleagues who are involved in the process are working with patients every day and are talking to them, listening to their aspirations and, and goals. That's very important because those are the most current patients available. The MCNs uh, often have patient groups and carer groups who feed into the networks and their views are taken uh, account of in managed clinical networks and that's fed back to us in the National Advisory Committee via the MCN subgroup. The charitable organisations, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, the Stroke Association, Different Strokes, also have patient groups who are asked about specific issues that we need to get the answers to, feedback, and that goes into our decision making. We've tended not to have patient representatives on the groups, the national uh, advisory groups and the subgroups, which we have had in the past. That was fairly challenging for patients and the carers uh, and probably we think isn't the best way of getting a broad view about whether our proposals are meeting the wishes and needs of patients. Yeah. You might have other things to say about that. No, I'll, I'll stay silent. <coughs> I know this afternoon, uh, Delic is going to have an opportunity uh, to discuss this in a bit more detail, and that'll be an interesting conversation. Uh, another question from Eric uh, around the, the reality that most people will require some form of rehabilitation, uh, and what are the plans uh, that we have to improve current variable quality and length of rehab? And I know you've touched on it. Martin, with, in terms of the ambitions of the improvement plan, but was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think it's, we found um, rehabilitation um, to be probably the most challenging part of stroke care to define and measure. Um, it's, and because of that, it's challenging in many ways because we don't have a really reliable evidence base to know how much rehabilitation is the optimum, when, when it should be started and how long it should go on for, and what type it is offered. And that leads to huge variation because there isn't um, clear guidance you can give based on evidence that doing it in one particular way is optimal. And it makes it difficult therefore to make a really powerful argument for, for instance, doubling the number of speech and language therapists to double the amount of uh, speech and language therapy that can be given. In general, the, the research that has been done hasn't shown major effects from these, this rehabilitation, even when the dose has been quite high. So I think we have to be careful about uh, interpreting the evidence. But, you know, I think all of us who work in stroke units um, are convinced that it does improve outcome, it does help meet the needs of patients and improve outcomes, but we're just not quite sure how best to do it. There are certainly, we are looking at how best to measure the rehabilitation we offer, therefore to measure the variability and to try and reduce that variability. By doing all of that, we should make an environment in which we can better do the research we need to do to find out the optimum ways of delivering rehabilitation, whether that's by increasing therapy that we you currently use, or maybe using different techniques such as robotics or particular computer programs to help support patients' self-management. All of these things we will be looking at. Indeed, we looked at the evidence for certain aspects of rehabilitation in last year's uh, horizon scanning. I'll finish then, happy to take any specific questions then. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, I have a question from Leslie. Uh, 
And she asks, is there any reason why there's a growing number of young stroke patients? And she says, as a younger stroke survivor, not all of our symptoms fall into fast. Can we raise awareness of the other signs and symptoms of a stroke? Um, yeah, I don't think that um, actually applies to young patients any more than older patients. Um, fast only picks up the sort of symptoms which occur in 70 or 80 percent of patients. Face drooping, weakness down one side, difficulty with speech. They are the most, probably the most important symptoms in terms of severity of stroke and those who require thrombolysis and thrombectomy. But stroke can affect any part of the brain and can produce very subtle symptoms. In fact, no symptoms at all. You can have an ischemic infarct, but no stroke symptoms. But it can cause other symptoms with vision only, complicated problems with communication, thinking. These, uh, I think we can hopefully improve the detection of these by improving the training of the ambulance staff and general practitioners, and also giving those people early access to somebody like myself who can recognize those very easily and therefore make a stroke diagnosis in the patient's home and make appropriate decisions early on. As far as young patients are concerned, uh, partly it's a perception thing that uh, many of us think that uh, stroke is a condition of the elderly and most of us came from a background of geriatric medicine in Scotland. So we were looking at uh, our patients and actually seeing many younger people. That wasn't necessarily all because there were more younger stroke patients. It was because they were becoming to people who hadn't previously looked after them. However, if you look at the data nationally, there has been a small rise in the number of young stroke admissions to hospital. That's in particular in those more deprived populations. And we do know that certain lifestyle choices people are making, such as uh, smoking, alcohol, uh, taking illicit drugs can cause stroke. Uh, obesity, which is obviously a problem in, in young people as well as older people, increases the risk of stroke. And social deprivation uh, is an important contributor to risk of stroke and leads to stroke occurring at a younger age. So all of these factors are uh, recognised. And indeed, within the rehabilitation subgroup, we have a a specific remit to look at the problems that young patients might have, in particular psychological problems and how we can best meet their needs. Um, not to say that your older people don't also have psychological problems, but often those are masked by their more major uh, physical problems as well. Uh, a really interesting question uh, from Roger. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if you're able to outline what areas of current Scottish stroke care you think offer little, offer little value and could be reduced? Um, yes, so I um, quite a, I think in COVID, we've interestingly uh, tried to work in different ways so that if a patient has a minor stroke or TIA, currently, they're more likely to be phoned probably on the same day or the day after by a stroke specialist who talks to them over the phone and or potentially using a video link to gain an initial uh, diagnosis and assessment of what they need. That can very efficiently be used to triage patients into those who need to come to a clinic, have further tests, or those who don't and can be reassured that they've had migraine. The old system was that all those patients would have been referred and seen in clinics, which would have delayed the clinic appointment for those who really needed it and wasted both the patients, their families, and to some extent the doctors and nurses time. So we can make, do things more efficiently. Similarly, there's a huge variation in the use of tests. So in some places, everybody is having a brain scan. Even where that brain scan is very unlikely to lead to improvement in the patient's treatment and outcome. 
That just means that the patient is being potentially irradiated for no great benefit and is delaying or reducing the, uh, the other patient's uh, uh, access to it. So we need to make sure that we are prioritizing both who we see, when we see them, how we uh, investigate them, and also how we treat them. So many patients who are receiving prolonged hospital admission, which is extremely expensive, actually will be benefiting very little from that hospital admission. They may be receiving lots of nursing home, not lots of nursing care, regular interventions from therapists, but with little gain because they've, their condition has plateaued. They might be better having been discharged to the community with ongoing support and, rehabil and some rehabilitation, and that might achieve a better outcome. So there are ways that we could better use the resources that we currently use. Thank you, Martin. I'm just conscious of time. We're almost at the hour mark. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. There was a couple of questions on uh, capacity of psychology services in the NHS and whether or not that has a limiting effect on uh, the ambitions for stroke moving forward. Um, Yes, to some extent. We recognise that a stroke has major psychological impacts on patients and their families with much more uh, anxiety, depression, emotionalism, uh, etc. And we need to provide patients with the best interventions to try and prevent that and improve that. Uh, some of those interventions are fairly simple and don't require the involvement of a psychologist directly. But hopefully psychologists are a very useful resource to help train and guide other healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, therapists, who can help patients along with people working in the third sector. Um, that leads us to our strategy, which is a stepped approach where the, the common and simple psychological needs of patients are met by nurses, doctors, therapists, the third sector. And one only escalates to them seeing a psychologist, maybe <coughs> remotely initially, and then face to face, where there is a more complicated need. Psychology sounds great because it deals with psychological problems. But again, we do have this issue that many of the interventions which they might employ, the assessments and interventions, haven't been well established as effective. And we do need to be doing more research into what can a psychologist deliver, which others can't, which will improve the psychological outcome of patients. Thank you, Mark, for that. Uh, we're, we're at the end of our hour, uh, and I think, I've, I've probably managed to pick up most questions. One or two I quite haven't, but I'm sure we can try and answer them offline. Uh, I just want to thank Martin for his time this morning, both his presentation uh, and the honesty with which he answered all of your questions. Uh, so a huge thanks, Martin. Thanks for, for coming along today. And uh, thank all participants for uh, listening and the questions you've put forward. There'll be an opportunity this afternoon uh, probably to debate some of this, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.